We'll wait just one more minute and then we'll begin. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this summit entitled Mental Health and Well-Being, hosted by the Government and Permanent Mission to the UN of Costa Rica, the co-chairs of the UN Group of Friends of Mental Health and Well-Being, the Permanent Missions of the Kingdom of Bahrain, the Kingdom of Belgium, Canada, and Ecuador, as well as the International Association for Human Values and the Art of Living Foundation. The objective of our event today is to highlight the significance of addressing mental health now. And I think we all agree it now is really more than ever because in an ever-changing post-pandemic world with high volatility and uncertainty with the war in the Ukraine and its rippling effect across all of us in the world, attending to mental health is now needed more than ever. And auspiciously, since May is Mental Health Month, we'd like to reinvigorate the commitment to the promotion, prevention, and care for mental health, particularly in these times of crisis. Now, before we get started, I'd like to just take a minute or two to introduce myself and today's speakers. And I would like to go over a few housekeeping points. Now, if you require transcription or subtitles, please feel free to enable transcription either in the ellipsis, which is the three dots, or in the CC or closed captioning icon. This meeting is being translated live into Spanish and you may access the translation icon in the bottom. La reunión está traducida al español Puede hacer clic en el icono de traducción. The meeting is being recorded and will be shared with all participants. We ask that you please keep your mic and video off so that we may have a smooth and uninterrupted free event. Now, feel free to use the chat box to ask any questions. We'll address as many questions as we can at the end of the session. And for the questions that we cannot address due to time constraints during the session, we will address them in a follow-up FAQ document that will be shared with all participants. It is really an honor to be here today and to share the floor with today's speakers. My name is Ronnie Newman, and I will be the moderator for today. Now, to make sure that we are being as inclusive as possible, I'd like to start out by giving a short visual description of myself. I am a Caucasian woman with brown hair and highlights. I have mid-length hair, green eyes, and I'm wearing a white jacket with a pink top. And I'm sitting in my sunny Florida home office. And behind me are my orchids, which I love. I am by training a Harvard trained researcher and published author in the field of mind body medicine. And I advocate on the importance of integrating evidence based mind body practices into public policy. I've presented on this topic 
at the UN, the World Bank, the National Institutes of Mental Health, and the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. I am the founding director of research and health promotion for the International Association for Human Values, and I'm currently co-authoring a study at Stanford Medical School in the Department of Pediatrics, which is studying the sky breath intervention, which Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar will be speaking about later in the prevention and treatment of ACEs or, or advanced adverse childhood experiences in underserved adolescents. And so I'd like to just briefly go over the agenda for today before we dive in, and then I'll go into each speaker's bio later. We will be opening remarks with, it looks like it was going to be Her Excellency Madam Epsi Campbell, the Vice President of Costa Rica. She may have been called away. And in that case, um, she will be, um, in her place will be Daniela Zavata, who is the Minister Council. Uh, for Costa Rica, and she will be uh, speaking on her behalf. And she is the Minister Council for the Permanent Mission of Costa Rica. I would also like to excuse Ambassador Carrazo, who is the permanent representative of Costa Rica to the UN for not being able to join us today. Unfortunately, he broke his wrist and is undergoing surgery today. We want to both thank him for the incredible work that he has done to organize this event, and we also wish him a speedy and full recovery. Okay, and, and this will be followed by His Excellency uh, Mr. Richard Abider, who is the Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative of Canada to the UN, who will speak on behalf of the UN Group of Friends of Mental Health and Wellbeing, and he will address the initiatives and priorities of that group. And finally, we will hear from Guru Dev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, who is a world humanitarian ambassador of peace and the founder of the Art of Living Foundation and the International Association of Human Values, both of whom are co-hosts to this event. And he will be speaking about the field successes of mind-body programs for mental health that his organization has been providing for four decades. And, you know, I'd like to start our session by clarifying just what is it that we mean by mental health? Often when we talk about mental health initiatives, I think most of us think about successfully treating anxiety, depression, and other mental health disorders. But fortunately, we know that this is not a complete definition of mental health. And that according to the World Health Organization's definition, and I quote, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. It reflects the highest attainable standard of health and is the fundamental right of every human being. So, in addressing mental health, we clearly must go on amelioration of disorders and seek to promote thriving. And the relevance of individual mental health could not be more relevant to our world today, since simply beyond personal mental health, the World Health Organization also recognizes that the health of all peoples is fundamental to the attainment. It's actually a prerequisite for the attainment of peace and security. And this in turn depends on the fullest cooperation, not only of individuals, but of states in policy. And in our world today, there is nothing more relevant. So to put in perspective the um, urgent need and the appropriateness of the session, I'd like to go over just a few key facts. You know, sadly, one in five children and adolescents in the world have a mental health disorder and half of them begin before the age of 14. Approximately one out of every nine people in settings affected by conflict whether it is global conflict or family violence and conflict, have a moderate or severe mental health disorder. Suicide accounts for 800,000 deaths every year, which means that every 40 seconds, one person commits suicide. It is the second leading cause of death in young people between the ages of 15 to 29. And very sadly, the suicide rates among 10 to 14 year olds have tripled 
in the last decade. <sighs> On top of that, the global economy loses in US dollars more than $1 trillion per year just in productivity, not even counting the expense of medical treatment or emotional duress due to only depression and anxiety alone. And even knowing how much is lost, we also know that it's impossible to solve the current mental health crisis with the existing standard of care of drugs and psychotherapy. The burden in terms of financial cost and staff burden make it untenable. So with these facts as a backdrop, let's look at the positive and the need to discover and promote innovative and globally scalable solutions to the need of our hour. And so this is where we are going to start our session today. So I believe that we will begin with uh, Minister Council uh, Zavata because I believe that uh, Madam Vice President Campbell is not available. Is and Madam right? Vice President is here, Ronnie. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So welcome, 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 Madam Vice President. And first of all, I would like to start by congratulating you on finishing your four-year term as Vice President this coming Saturday. And we all thank you for taking the time to be here with us during your last week in office. And as you move forward, the world will still benefit as you continue your good work in the field of mental health, because she will be presiding over the Mental Health Committee in the Pan American Health Organization of the World Health Organization. Now, a little bit of background. As Vice President of Costa Rica, she is the first woman of African descent to hold that position in the Americas. She served two terms in Congress and was Minister of Foreign Affairs. And not just us, but Forbes magazine recognized her as one of the most powerful women in Latin America and the Caribbean, and as one of the most influential women was noted by Strategy and Business magazine. Her excellence holds a doctorate of humanities, two master's degrees, one in international development cooperation, and a second master's in advanced management and policy decision techniques, as well as a bachelor's in economics. Madam Vice President will share about the importance of mental health, especially as it relates to women, indigenous groups, and African descendants. Madam Vice President, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Ronnie. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I am Mr. Richard, Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative of Canada. Also, Gudri Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, World Humanitarian and Ambassador of Peace. I am very happy and grateful to participate in this discussion about mental health and wellness in post pandemic times. One of the central elements of people's reality is and has been mental health. However, it has been given very little relative importance and very few resources have been invested at the level of public health and also in the private sector. Mental health has been seen the best for the best majority of time from the perspective of chronic mental illness. That is why I would like to congratulate the organization of this amazing discussion and also the government of, of Canada, you as a moderated, as a, as a award winning researcher and author of field of mind body medicine. Thank you very much. And also the foundation of the art of living and our mission, uh, the mission of Costa Rica, New York, New York that we can put some elements related the mental health and the well-being of people into the focus of public debate. A significant determinant that, that cannot longer be made invisible in this construction of mental health is the condition and position of gender and his, his impacts in health. The inequalities 
that women experience daily generate a severe effect on their possibility or not, or living with well-being and quality life, in particular, the gender socialization, discrimination, and direct or indirect violence that they face in all areas. Another issue that you put in the introduction is the reality of Joan people and children in this matter of mental health. Within the framework of Agenda for Sustainable Development 2030, the need to intensify action to close gender gaps and guarantee full economic empowerment of women is more urgent if we're thinking in terms of mental health. It is so important that understand that the reality of the pandemic is have a very, very, very impact in the in mental health of women. Until a few years ago, health and illness was analyzed as its affect women and men equally. But, but we, we know that is this is not the case. Disaggregate, disaggregating and doing a gender analysis of the health statistics made it possible to identify particular experience that discrimination that former that former in, in women. The effects of COVID-19 pandemic could reverse the few gains that have been made in terms of gender equality, but also in terms of health, total and integral health of women. COVID-19 has identified existing inequalities and it's be most vulnerable in the most vulnerable communities harder than anyone else. It has exposed the economic disparities and fragile social safety nets that leave vulnerable communities to bear the, the brunt of the crisis. But it is so important that we link the, re the economic and social reality of women with her mental health. Leaving no one behind is a responsibility of everyone, the state, the sector, the private sector, the international organization, the academia, etc. Still, compliance with the sustainable development goals must be based on citizen action that generates the consensus and commitment of multiple actors. And also to integrate issues as mental health. In addition to the international community and the public sector, it is cru crucial the role in this issue of one being of the private sector and civil societies, uh, society as agent of change must, must be not only concerned, but must be in action. Putting women in, and girls at the center of the economies, at the center of the society, will fundamentally lead to better and more sustainable development outcome for all, support faster recovery, and put the word on the track to achieve the sustainable development. I want to say again, if we cannot see the mental health as a necessity of the society, we cannot go to see the involved in equal terms of women and men. The COVID-19 pandemic has not only impact people physically health, and, but also, as I say, I want to say again, also seriously affect people's mental health and well-being, especially women and young people. Concerning mental health, the statistics of this effect were already alarming before the pandemic. Depression effect as estimating 206 64 million of people around the world and people with severe mental health condition are estimated to the die to 10 and to 20 years earlier than general population. The previous acquired particular relevance in once considered that 
worldwide, there is less than one mental health professional for every 10,000 people and only 2% of the health budget is allocated to mental health. According for, to the World Health Organization, countries spend an average of 2% of their, of their health budgets on mental health, as I say. And in international assistance in mental health is only 1%. If we see the data, we know that we can do more, more. It is essential that economic re reactivation policy that are generated in our region can address, have to address mental health as an investment and not, an, and not only as a social expense. In Costa Rica, Bill 22, 430 National Mental Health Law is currently in our legislature, in, in our Congress for the second debate. We are advanced. The purpose of this bill is to raise mental health to the normative level four. Ensure the right to protection of the mental health of all the people and full enjoyment of human rights. The other objective is to regulate the mental health care framework more for that it's possible to provide the best care, treatment and rehabilitation following the human rights of all the people. The, the third objective is to strengthen the mental health model aimed and, pre and prevention, maintenance, repair and reinsertion. Fourth, detail the rights of users of mental health service and finally, promote the full and effective inclusion of people with mental disorders in society by promoting, protecting, and warranting their rights. My office has identifi identifi identified the need to create the Regional Alliance Women's Mental Health, which is proposed as a group of countries, organization, and leaders agree on the importance of mental health in the development of human beings from a gender perspective, particularly on women throughout their life cycle. It is convinced as a consultant, it is conceived as a consultative platform between the countries, organization, academia, that compromise it promote dialogue, exchange experience, and promote initiative at the national, international, and local level. It is vitally, it is, it is a vital importance to prioritize the mental health and well-being of women, young people, girls, as a public health and human rights imperative. Recognize it is also crucial element for the socioeconomic recovery of all the countries. Only a society that works together, physical and mentally healthy without difference or inequalities will be able to achieve well-being for everyone in every country every day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice President. That was so beautiful and so inspiring and so totally on point. And yes, it is beyond purely a mental health issue. It is clearly a human rights issue addressing the full range of what is needed for humanity. And you so beautifully pointed out the value that when we address mental health, it goes so far beyond mental health it speaks to peace, it speaks to sustainable economies, it speaks to progress globally and to our economic recovery. In fact, um, what you're speaking about, um, there was an article that was just published that was done by the Harvard School for Public um, Affairs where they noted in their analysis that for every dollar spent on mental health, it saves the states or nations 
$2. So for every dollar spent in terms of future because of the relationship between mental health disorders and physical health disorders and um, pr productivity lost and lost of opportunity, that it actually costs money not to address mental health. So what you're doing is so inspiring. And of course, looking at women, which is half of the world's population, are being put in a disadvantaged position where the struggle for mental health is, is even more burdensome, that it will serve the world and all of us much better by addressing vulnerable populations. And half of the world right now, because of the statistics you mentioned, are a vulnerable population. So we thank you for this and for promoting for the enjoyment of full human rights for everyone on earth. God bless you for the good work you do. We look forward to all of us coming together and collaborating together to support the enthusiasm and vision that you have. So thank you so much for your inspiring time with us. And we would now like to move on. Well, I don't want to move on, but I know time requires us to move on to His Excellency, Mr. Arbaida. His Excellency is deputy, is ambassador and deputy permanent representative of Canada to the UN in New York. He has been in the Canadian Foreign Service for over 20 years, since 2001. He is the director of policy and advocacy that division for Afghanistan Task Force. He's the G7D20 Sherpa Assistant and Director for International Economic Relations and the Summits Division. He's the Director General of the Office of Human Rights, Freedom and Inclusions. The direct, I don't know how he does all of this and sleeps at all. The Director General International for the Security Policy Bureau. He has a Master's in International Affairs from Carleton University in Ottawa and a BA in North American Studies from the highly prestigious McGill University in Montreal. And Mr. Ambassador will share some of the initiatives from the UN's group of Friends of Mental Health and Wellbeing. Please, the well, floor you. is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and I assure you, those, those are past jobs. I'm not still doing all, <laughs> all of those <laughs> things. Hopefully I've learned a little bit from them, but uh, I'm, I'm now here in New York just trying to do um, this one. Um, good afternoon, buenas tardes, buenas tardes, distinguished colleagues. Let me start by thanking Her Excellency Vice President Campbell and the permanent mission of Costa Rica to the UN. Um, Vice President, you are uh, indeed an inspiration. We have a, a privileged partnership um, with your mission here, as both of our, our countries do. You have a wonderful team here in New York, and it's always a, a pleasure to work with you and to learn from you. Let me also thank the International Association for Human Values and the Art of Living Foundation for organizing this event. And most importantly, let me thank the now 339 participants who've tuned in, um, who have demonstrated an interest in trying to learn about this uh, issue and, and trying to help all of us do a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Now, I'm here to, to speak on behalf of the Group of Friends of Mental Health, uh, alongside the, my co-chairs from uh, Bahrain, Belgium, and, and Ecuador, um, four countries from four different parts uh, of the world. Now, our group uh, is about five or six years uh, old. And in our first few years, if you kind of think about you know, starting out, we were making sure everybody knew who we were. <laughs> and, and we were trying to draw attention to the work that we were, we were doing. Um, and that meant um, not only shedding light uh, and building understanding on, on specific issues, but really trying to work across the global community to destigmatize uh, mental health and make it part of the conversation, um, no matter the issue that we were looking at, because it affects all, uh, all issues. Um, over the past couple of years, we've tried to uh, get a little bit more specific, and we've tried to focus on what are the mental health elements um, of issues confronting the UN community in particular. So we've had dedicated discussions around the impact of the pandemic, especially on youth. We've had dedicated discussions on mental health uh, and cyber issues, particularly for teens and, and adolescents. We've had sessions on mental health and peacekeeping and mental health in humanitarian situations across others, uh, across other issues. And we've also tried to um, be a focus for sharing resources within the diplomatic community understanding that our colleagues, our friends, our families, 
um, here also require resources to address mental health issues that may affect them or may affect um, those in their immediate um, community. We've also tried to encourage strong UN engagement on mental health and well-being by demonstrating um, significant political support for the Secretary General's action in the field and those of UN agencies, including the World Health Organization, and supporting the UN mental health strategy. Now, if you can imagine, um, the UN has uh, employees all over the world, um, some of which who are charged with supporting communities who may have experienced or are experiencing very traumatic events. Um, those events may have mental health implications for the employees themselves, uh, in addition to the communities there. And so we've really tried to support the UN in its efforts to up its game uh, in making sure that the community of employees that deploy on behalf of all of us have the tools that they need to provide the consistent support that we know communities require. Now, we're looking at this discussion today on promoting mental uh, and emotional resilience in, in time of crises. And let me um, start by uh, agreeing entirely with how gendered this issue is. <laughs> and that um, the most intelligent approach is one that understands that there are multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination that affect individuals no matter where they live um, that need to be taken into account in how the uh, issue is, is, uh, is, is treated. Um, and while, of course, there's been uh, a lot of attention appropriately so on the particular impact of, of women and vulnerable communities and those who may not be able to access health services, um, let me uh, also say that uh, the suicide rates described by our moderator earlier are predominantly men who choose to take their lives. I think the last time I looked into this, it was three to four, three or four to one in terms of men to women. Um, and at the risk of oversimplifying or overgeneralizing it, because men aren't terribly good at asking for help. <laughs> and so we need to kind of understand also what are the gendered impacts of mental health issues on, on, on men and on boys, and ensure that our approaches take those into account um, as, uh, as well. Now, this is obviously in the context of an ongoing global pandemic. And from our perspective uh, in the group of friends of, of mental health, COVID is at once the most global and yet local experience that we've all had. Everybody had and is having a COVID experience, but it may be slightly different depending on where you are and what, how it's affected yourself, your family, and your local community. It's really important to understand that there are differences in how the pandemic has and continues to, uh, to affect us. Now, as the moderator pointed out, it's Global Health Month. It's also Global Health, uh, sorry, Mental Health uh, Week in Canada. And the theme um, for the Canadian Mental Health Week uh, this week is empathy. And that's kind of where I wanted to end uh, these introductory remarks with uh, a simple um, suggestion that we all do what we've already doing, but maybe more frequently and with greater intention. There's a simple thing that we typically do when we see one another, we say, how are you? <laughs> uh, and it's a really important thing to do, to actually ask and to listen to the answer and to engage in conversations um, with one another um, the best support is often from people that know you or that you feel you know. <laughs> um, and just the simple act of listening and demonstrating empathy can have uh, unknown impact, frankly, given the scale of the mental health crisis around the world. I will stop there. And again, thank you for your attention and your time. I look forward to the rest of the session. Yes. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And you highlight on an individual level what we can do to really influence mental health on a global capacity. And it's been found that it triggers the empathy and the calming centers in the brain when we actually look at somebody and say, how are you? That the floodgates open up and it does open the gates for healing and openness to resolve repressed issues that we know come out in many ways. And especially with adolescents, it is absolutely accurate that we do point out that adolescents have a very difficult time asking for help, which is why some of the programs, incidentally, that Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar will be talking about soon are directed toward inclusiveness and wellness in the adolescent population. So they don't have to self-identify as having problems, but you can bring the solutions under a different umbrella so that they are able to, in an innovative way, address their mental health issues. So thank you so much for the good work you do and for your time here. And I would now like to move on to introduce Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, who will speak to 
the field initiatives that he has codified for treating and preventing mental health disorders, and beyond that, for promoting optimal mental health, including in adolescence, as we just discussed. Shri Sh Gurudev Shri Sri Ravi Shankar is a world humanitarian and ambassador of peace who is the founder of the Art of Living Foundation. He has adapted the time-honored yogic science of breath to address the needs of modern times, including the mental health needs through the sky breathing technique. Sky has been taught in 150 countries and documented in peer-reviewed studies for being effective in treating depression, anxiety, PTSD, aggression, and substance use across cultures and economies globally. He is the founder of the International Association for Human Values with peacekeeping programs like the PRISON program, which has reach more than 800,000 people in 20 countries worldwide, and the Healing Resilience and Empowerment Program for those at risk of and those already diagnosed with mental health disorders in 31 countries, ranging from Afghanistan to the current Ukrainian refugees in Poland, the Netherlands, and Germany. He is a peace mediator supporting conflict resolution in Colombia, Sri Lanka, Kashmir, and India, and he has received 23 honorary doctorates from across the globe in recognition for his humanitarian initiatives. And so welcome, Gurudev. And we have a two-part question for you. First, you just completed a tour in Europe where your centers are receiving and providing both humanitarian and mental health support for Ukrainian refugees. So how are your initiatives effective in so many different disorders, like what we just mentioned, PTSD, depression, and in different cultures and conditions ranging from individuals in refugee camps to university students and the public at large? And second, will you speak to the importance and the effectiveness of these field programs in promoting optimal mental health, true thriving once the mental health disorders have been healed. Hello everybody, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be with you all on this topic, which is very dear to me, see? A strong mind can carry along a weak body, but not the other way around. A weak mind cannot carry along a strong body. In today's situation where we see uh, on one hand, there is depression. On the other side, there is aggression. Both are not signs of uh, robust well-being or health. So we need to address this issue, especially after the uh, pandemic, post-pandemic uh, era, where people had to, you know, um, their change their whole routine routines and then there was so much disruption in their day-to-day -day life. And on top of it, now this war has really taken a big toll on the mental health of our population. The amount of suicides that are being reported and many that are being unreported is alarming. So for this, you know, we need to channel the energy, the human energy, human emotions into the right channel, into something positive. For this, recently I've taken up this initiative, I Stand for Peace. See, when people feel so helpless and hopeless, uh, it's natural that they fall into a state of uh, depression. So when they have something to do, however insignificant it is in a larger contest, but uh, it just empowers them that, and makes them feel good that they are standing up for something. They are doing something. So their energies are channeled uh, in a positive manner so that they, they can get over their feeling of this, uh, you know, um, desperation and despondency. So uh, we started this campaign, I Stand for Peace in Europe. In, in Spain, in Switzerland, in Germany, Poland, in all other parts of Europe. And it has really moved the whole atmosphere from, a, from that of a negative to something that
that is a little more positive. I would say we still have a long way to go because every day what we see in the television is devastation here and there and the war crimes, it has very badly affected the psyche of our society, psyche of mankind. So we need to give them a different orientation. So we thought this would be one such thing. The people say, I stand for peace and spread that message that we all stand for peace. You know, um, that collective intention can create a better atmosphere for people, number one. Second is, of course, we are emphasizing the role of breathing, how breath has an important role to play in our mental health. It can reduce the depression and also uh, bring down the aggressive behavior that people tend to have due to high stress, high stress levels. So these breathing techniques and exercises we are teaching all over the globe today and help people to get out of their uh, challenges. The other thing is the prejudice about mental health. People who are having issues, they often don't admit that they have some mental health problem. Unlike uh, any physical ailments, people, uh, you know, and sometimes they even take pride of, uh, you know, happily go and tell the doctors, I have this illness, that illness. Sometimes they sort of um, take pride in it. Mental illness is not that way. Here, they try to hide and deny it. And so we don't even say that you have mental health issue, but we say, See, this is exercise for well-being. It can make you more happier. And of course, everyone wants to be more happy. So to become more happy, they would love to practice something to get rid of stress. People would practice. And in short period of time, two days, three days, four days, they feel uh, back on track. And I think we need more volunteers uh, who can you know, give such counseling to people around the world. I often say, you know, when you are hungry, there is a restaurant around the corner. You can go and eat. And if you want to do exercise, there are gymnasiums all over. And you want to go to beauty parlor to make yourself look, look more beautiful. Yeah, it's available everywhere. Entertainment, today you get all on your own cell phone. But to become happy, to, to get rid of stress, you hardly find a place. So we need more happiness centers and counselors and volunteers who take mental health as a serious issue. I'm glad the World Health Organization has recognized mental health as a big issue in the coming uh, years. So we all have to work together uh, to put our society back on track on a robust, mental health. For this, uh, our foundation, Art of Living Foundation, International Society of Human Values is already, we have been working for the last 41 years and we have all testimonies and proofs how we can bring back the joy or happiness into the lives of people without any big medication and with natural processes and techniques and meditations. And we would be very happy to collaborate with any organization or any governments uh, to bring back the health and sanity in our society. See, the aggression among the college students and school children incidences of violence are really appalling. And we have been working on school district in US, in India, in Europe, in many other parts of the world uh, to help the children, see, get rid of stress and uh, feel more happier. And similarly, we are doing for corporates, um, corporations, many companies are using our techniques, our programs for wellness, as wellness programs and well-being in their uh, workplace. 
and we would be very happy and more we'll be pleased to work with any organization or even researchers if any of the mental health experts would like to do research with these techniques breathing techniques and meditation techniques we are very open to that also with these few words i once again uh, congratulate all the doctors and uh, professors and heads of states who are participating in this uh, conference and who have recognized the mental health issue as a looming challenge for the whole planet today thank you very much thank you guru dev that is so inspiring and so insightful that to call it happiness program totally removes the stigma and makes it more accessible and the fact that when we know that when individuals do any action whether it's exercise or service programs like standing for an idea like i stand for peace it actually begins to release those chemicals in the brain that counter depression and anxiety so it's it's a brilliant strategy and i know that you have to go i would like to just see if we can uh press upon you for one more question to ask you if you can describe how it, the mechanism for why breathing practices are so effective at dealing with emotions and calming the depression and the anxiety what is the relationship between breath and emotions can you clarify that for our audience yes yes rodi um, see every emotion has a definite pattern of breathing associated with it so we have ignored this fact how emotions and breathing are connected and it is not um, highlighted at all it's not being attended to at all uh, this is where we have done extensive study that the breath for every uh, or one of its pattern is associated with a specific emotion for example when you are angry you breathe differently you breathe faster when you are happy and calm and serene your breath flows um, you know very gently um, in large cycles so and then when you are um, when you are so stressed then you sigh you know the deep breath that comes out of so like that your breathing patterns and rhythms have a lot to do so using the same mechanics that you when you attend to your breath and correct the patterns you will see uh, that you are, you can change your own state of mind so you, do, you don't have to feel uh, you know as though you are helpless because you are not feeling good rather you can change your moods at your own will so this is what is the biggest uh, advantage of knowing about the breathing patterns it empowers you uh, beyond you, your own imagination yeah so you can say that your moods are under your control not you getting completely drowned in the bad moods that you go through yeah that is so brilliant and so practical and i thank you so much for being with us and your time and i will just explain to our community here that shri shri is has to leave us now before the end of our session because he will be speaking at yale university later this afternoon there was an incredible study done at yale on mental health in college students because that age adolescent has a disproportionately high number of mental health disorders and yale conducted a study looking at four different mental health programs for adolescents and what they found was that the sky breath program which was brought to the west by gurudev was superbly effective significantly more effective than any other treatment any of the other three treatments that were looked at and so yale has invited him to address the community there so he does have to leave us for that so thank you gurudev get today there is a little change in program i have to leave for connecticut there is another program there so yes. i was addressing the harvard uh, university yesterday we had a meeting there about the emotional intelligence so uh, i wish you all the best in your uh, endeavor and let's all work together 
and um, I'm there for you all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And we will continue the good work. Thank you so much. Okay, so we do have a few questions that I would like to address to our other esteemed panelists. And so the first question for both of you or either of you is, what do you see as the future of mental health treatment and prevention? What is your hope? What do you see? And the second question that has come up is how can we raise more awareness and commitment and resources to create better policies and build more effective solutions? Ambassador, would you like to start? Well, I, I can try. Those are very big questions. Um, look, I, I would like to say that the future of treatment and prevention is more treatment and more prevention. <laughs> and that, <laughs> you know, and that the proportion of um, national health budgets, uh, health systems budgets that are that are allocated to mental health steadily and progressively increases um, over time uh, in all parts of the world. Yes. Uh, here, like that, that to me um, is where it needs to go. Um, you know, the overarching objective of any health system, no matter where it is, is to serve its community, to serve its population. Um, and, you know, our health systems um, have tried to get better to reflect what are the new and evolving needs of, of communities. And I think it's clear um, that this is <laughs> not a new, but certainly a, a more recognized need. And uh, it's sort of my link to the second part of the question, which was about raising awareness. I think events like the one we're having today, uh, like the ones we have here across the UN, um, uh, do serve a, a purpose of raising awareness, of um, socializing the issue a little bit, a little bit better. I, I think it's actually um, th this perverse reality that COVID has brought this issue a little bit more to the forefront. Yes. I'm not wishing a pandemic on anybody, <laughs> but yes. Yes. I think uh, uh, you know, no matter where you are in the world, you recognize that there more a likely to recognize that there are mental health um, elements to, to um, you know, better providing for, for communities. The one example I'll use on this, um, we, we recently had a discussion with uh, Philippe Grande, who is the High Commissioner for Refugees, and he was talking about his uh, recent trip to Poland uh, and to other countries uh, close to uh, Ukraine, where he met with the mayor of Krakow. Uh, and asked the mayor, what is your number one need? And the response from, from the mayor was psychologists and therapists. You know, we have trauma from uh, people on the move who've come in here, who've experienced where we still have the uh, mental health challenges associated with the pandemic. Um, and we don't have enough individuals who have the capabilities to respond to those needs. That is um, not only accurate, but what's amazing about that is you have the mayor of a town in Eastern Europe identifying it as their number one need, uh, their number one gap in their community. And that says to me that awareness raising is working. It's getting there, driven by need, of course. But um, I think the trajectory uh, is positive in terms of recognizing mental health as a key component of, of health systems. Yes, exactly. And so in closing, you highlight that now then more than ever, we need to commit to promoting mental health and thinking outside the box for scalable, innovative solutions. Because the current data again shows that the investment in resources that we have is insufficient. And even if the necessary resources were made available, the current mental health treatments are not totally hitting the mark. They're not being 100% effective to prevent and treating mental health disorders. So I invite in closing all of us every one of us to look at mental health differently. Know that it affects all of us at different moments, at different points in our lives. And that if we really are looking for a sustainable peace and for full human rights, we all need greater support and more effective policies and solutions to deal with the mental health crisis. We need innovative, scalable, cost-effective solutions to both treat mental illness that exists, but also to promote a pulsating, thriving state of individual well being where individuals can express life to the fullest and contribute in their greatest capacity to the well being of our planet. So, with that, I would like to thank you all again.
for joining us, especially our esteemed guests. And a special thanks to the co-hosts of this event, the government of Costa Rica, the co-chairs of the UN Group of Friends of Mental Health and Wellbeing, the permanent missions of the Kingdom of Bahrain, the Kingdom of Belgium, Canada, and Ecuador, and the International Association for Human Values and the Art of Living Foundation. Thank you all. And during the month of May and throughout the whole year, let's work together to promote greater mental health and well-being. Thank you all for joining us. We look forward to our continuing collaboration.